Christmas night. Fatal famine. The ICJ demands Israel put a stop to furthering starvation in the West Bank as the most vulnerable of the inhabitants in the region struggle to stay alive with essentially no more aid. Surprise veto. Russia affirms its allyship with North Korea as the UN panel dedicated to the country sees dissolution, the move causing unrest in global diplomacy. Port problems. With the Red Sea crisis seeing no end in sight, Indian and other regional ports prepare for a fresh influx of trade, grappling against supply and demand disparity. And aliens or not? Arizona saw an awesome display of daredevil feats that came off as simply out of this world. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. We have a plethora of stories to update you on this evening on our final bulletin for the week. From the Red Sea crisis to Biden's latest election ploys. But first and foremost, we begin with the Israel-Palestine conflict. The World Court has ordered Israel to end the spreading of famine in Gaza, demanding it take all necessary and effective action to ensure basic food supplies to the Palestinians there. The unanimous ruling from the International Court of Justice came as aid agencies say only about a fifth of needed supplies are entering the war-shattered enclave. The World Court judges said in their order, quote, the court observes that Palestinians in Gaza are no longer facing only a risk of famine, but that famine is setting in. The judges said this could be done by, quote, increasing the capacity and number of land crossing points and maintaining them open for as long as necessary. The court ordered Israel to submit a report in a month to detail how it had given effect to the ruling. The new measures were requested by South Africa as part of its case that accuses Israel of state-led genocide in Gaza. A senior Hamas official said the ruling did not go far enough and Israel must be ordered to end its military offensive to halt the suffering, saying, quote, We welcome any new demands to end this humanitarian tragedy in Gaza and especially in the northern Gaza Strip, but we hope the court would order a ceasefire as an absolute solution to all the miseries our people in Gaza are living through. The UN Security Council voted on Tuesday to demand an immediate ceasefire and the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. Abstention. In a change from its previous stance, the United States abstained from but did not veto the vote. There was no immediate comment from Israel's foreign ministry on Thursday's World Court ruling. Israel has said it is making efforts to expand access for humanitarian groups to Gaza over land, through airdrops and by ship. But aid agencies say it's not nearly enough, and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has described the number of trucks blocked at the border as a moral outrage. It is a moral outrage. And now an update on the Moscow massacre. Russia continues to say that Ukraine was involved in last week's terror attack in Moscow, saying it has secured evidence of Kyiv's involvement. The U.S., meanwhile, says the accusations are unfounded, calling it propaganda to shift the blame on Ukraine and the U.S. It's been nearly a week since the terror attack at the Crocus City Hall music venue in Moscow, which killed over 140 people and injured a dozen more. Four gunmen from Tajikistan have already been charged over the attack, and Islamic State also released a video claiming responsibility. However, Moscow continues to blame Kyiv, saying it has secured evidence that last week's terror attack was orchestrated by Ukraine. A statement issued by the Russian Investigative Committee on Thursday said that the gunmen were linked to Ukrainian nationalists and had received a significant amount of cash and cryptocurrency from Ukraine to conduct the terror attack. However, the committee did not provide any evidence to support its accusations. Experts at U.S. think tank the Institute for the Study of War have rejected claims of Ukraine's involvement, given the fact that IS would not carry out an attack on behalf of Ukraine, a Christian nation. Meanwhile, Washington says Moscow's continued blame game against Ukraine is propaganda to shift the blame to Kyiv and Washington, stressing that there's no evidence of Ukraine's involvement. 
White House National Security Advisor John Kirby during a press briefing on Thursday said Russian President Vladimir Putin and his officials are trying to shift the blame when it's clear that the Islamic State is fully responsible, adding that Washington had provided intelligence to Russian authorities before the terror attack and warned them in writing. Kirby added that the U.S. provided intelligence to Russia because it did not want to see innocent lives lost to terrorism. And still in the region, Russia has shut down a panel of UN experts that have for years monitored sanctions against North Korea. The panel last week said it was probing reports that Russia violated rules by buying North Korean weapons like ballistic missiles for use in Ukraine. The UN Security Council has imposed a series of sanctions on Pyongyang since 2006 for its nuclear weapons program. Those restrictions are still in force, but the experts group set up to monitor violations will now be disbanded. In a Security Council vote, Russia used its veto power as a permanent member to block the renewal, while 13 of the other 14 member states present voted for it. China, Pyongyang's closest ally, abstained. Russia's bloc triggered a wave of condemnation from the US, UK, South Korea and other Western allies and comes after a year of high-profile public meetings between Moscow and Pyongyang leaders. This is the first time Russia has blocked the panel, which has been renewed annually by the UN Security Council for 14 years. Ukraine's foreign ministers said Russia's veto was tantamount to a guilty plea that it was using North Korean weapons in the war. An update to the Red Sea crisis now. We are seeing its effects in our region. In the wake of vessel routings, uh, reroutings aimed at avoiding the Red Sea, bunker demand across ports in India has witnessed a massive surge, highlighting a growing challenge for the maritime industry. While India contends with supply shortages, other ports in the region are experiencing a notable increase in activity. According to the S&P Global Commodity Insights, the demand spike, estimated to be over 30% in ports across India, has been primarily attributed to longer voyages undertaken by ship owners and charters to circumvent the Red Sea region. Consequently, ports on India's west coast, particularly Kochi and Mumbai, are grappling with disrupted very low sulfur fuel oil supplies, exacerbating the situation. Despite increased demand, price movements in the bunker fuel market have been mixed. The supply crunch at Indian ports, particularly Kuchi, has been further bolstered demand at other regional ports. And now some real estate updates over in China. Country Garden, China's largest private property developer, delayed the publication of its 2023 financial results, saying it needed to collect more information to make appropriate accounting estimates and judgments. The developer defaulted on $11 billion of offshore bonds late last year. It also missed a $13.3 million coupon payment this month. Shares will be suspended from April 2nd, pending the publication of the annual results. Country Garden said the suspension of trading wouldn't have a material impact on its operations. It said it would continue to work closely with its auditor to publish the results as soon as it could. But it did not set a new publication date. Country Garden is in the process of restructuring its offshore debt and said it is actively engaged in discussions with creditors. As reported Wednesday, Country Garden has hired Kroll to carry out a liquidation analysis ahead of a court hearing in mid-May. The company's problems come as China's property sector has lurched from one crisis to another since 2021. A regulatory crackdown and high leverage among developers led to a liquidity crisis. Many big-name companies have since struggled. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More key global stories right after this. Welcome back. We resume our reporting with an unfortunate tragedy. 45 people have died in South Africa after the bus they were in plunged some 50 meters off a bridge into a ravine. The passengers were pilgrims traveling from Botswana's capital Gaboron to an Easter service in the town of Moria. An 80-year-old girl, the only survivor, sustained serious injuries but is now in a stable condition. 
The bus crashed through a barrier and caught fire when it hit the ground in the northeastern Limpopo province. 34 body bags have been taken from the scene, but only nine bodies are currently identifiable. This is the aftermath of a bus crash in South Africa's northern province of Limpopo. The Department of Transport said on Thursday that at least 45 people had been killed. The driver lost control and collided with barriers on a bridge near Mamadlakala. The bus went over the bridge and hit the ground, catching fire, according to the transport department. It added that the bus was taking Easter pilgrims from Botswana to Moria, a town in Limpopo. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa sent his condolences to Botswana and pledged support to the country, his office said in a statement. Limpopo's Department of Transport said only an eight-year-old survived the crash and was receiving medical attention at a nearby hospital. Some bodies were burned beyond recognition while others were trapped inside the debris or scattered on the scene. And on the road to the White House tonight, we see the Dems pulling at all strings necessary for those extra few votes. President Biden was joined by former Presidents Obama and Clinton at an event at New York's Radio City Music Hall. The Biden campaign said that the event will raise $25 million. Meanwhile, former President Trump also attended the wake of a New York police officer who was shot and killed this week. All this as North Dakota prepares to head to the polls. And for updates on the ground, we have other there in the world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. What's the latest, Suzanne? Yes, I rally. Joe Biden and Donald Trump are in a new phase of a heavyweight fundraising smackdown as the US president raised a record $25 million at a glitzy event with Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, while Trump's Republican campaign claimed it would outdo Biden next week with a $33 million event in Florida. Biden and his Democratic predecessor headlined a star-studded fundraiser with Clinton at the Radio City Music Hall event, hosted by Mindy Kaling and featured Lizzo, Queen Latifah and Stephen Colbert. Obama and Biden flew to the city on Air Force One together in a show of unity and democratic campaign heft as the 2024 election enters an important phase between the main primary season and the summer nominating conventions, which are expected to anoint Biden and Trump as their party's candidates. The glittering democratic fundraiser was punctuated by protest not just outside but also inside the auditorium as attendees rose at several different moments to shout out the discussion referencing biden's backing of israel's war in gaza obama and biden has moral clarity on the israel issue and is willing to listen to all sides in his debate and find common ground Meanwhile, it was reported that Trump believes he can outrace the Biden event with a billionaire's power party as his, at his Mar-a-Lago residence and resort club in Palm Beach, where tickets will run from $250,000 to more than $800,000. The Trump campaign's goal is at least $33 million, with featured super-rich names such as Steve Wine, John Paulson, and Robert Bigelow. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Thanks again. <music> Updates from the tech world. Now the coffin is finally sealed. Sam Bankman Fried was sentenced to 25 years in prison by a judge for stealing $8 billion from customers of the now bankrupt FTX cryptocurrency exchange he founded the last step in the former billionaire Wonderkin's dramatic downfall. Sam Bankman Fried was sentenced to 25 years in prison on Thursday. The former billionaire and founder of a defunct cryptocurrency exchange was found guilty by a jury last November of stealing $8 billion from customers of FTX, the exchange he'd founded in what prosecutors said was one of the largest financial frauds in U.S. history. The 32-year-old Bankman Fried was convicted on seven counts of fraud and conspiracy stemming from FTX's collapse in 2022. At the sentencing, U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan said, quote, He knew it was wrong. He knew it was criminal. 
He regrets that he made a very bad bet about the likelihood of getting caught, but he is not going to admit a thing, as is his right. Bankman Fried acknowledged during 20 minutes of remarks to the judge that FTX customers had suffered, and he offered an apology to his former FTX colleagues. A prosecutor with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan told the judge, quote, The criminality here is massive in scale. It was pervasive in all aspects of the business. Federal prosecutors had sought a prison sentence of 40 to 50 years. Bankman Fried's defense lawyer had argued that a sentence of less than five and a quarter years would be appropriate. He also tried to distance his client from other notorious fraudsters, such as Bernie Madoff, saying, quote, Sam was not a ruthless financial serial killer who set out every morning to hurt people. Bankman Fried has vowed to appeal his conviction and sentence. Humans have once again proven to be a very wasteful species. Households around the world threw away one billion meals every single day in what the United Nations called a global tragedy of food waste. One billion meals thrown away every day. That is according to the UN's latest food waste index report. The report, which was released on Wednesday, is just the second of its kind to be compiled by the United Nations. It described the wastage as a moral and environmental failure. Food waste is a global tragedy. Millions will go hungry today as food is wasted across the world. More than $1 trillion worth of food was binned in 2022. Restaurants, canteens and hotels made up 28% of that number while butchers and greengrocers accounted for 12%. But the guiltiest party by far were households, accounting for a staggering 60%, some 631 million tonnes. In Europe, Portugal were the biggest culprits when it came to household waste, at a whopping 124 kilograms per person, with Italy not far behind at 107 kilograms. At the same time, 800 million people are facing starvation across the planet. According to one expert, that number could be fed over a meal a day just from the food that is wasted every single year. The report also indicated that such food wastage is a key driver of climate change, generating up to 10% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. How many times have you happened across a strange sighting, something that looks hard to comprehend? Apart from writing it up to be caused by supernatural forces, maybe it was a blip in the sky and the thought of aliens could have crossed your mind? Well, residents in Arizona thought the same, but the answer is far, far cooler. Hey, hey, come! What the heck is falling from the sky? Holy where'd it go? The brilliant streaks of light were so striking it had lots of people convinced aliens were about to land on planet Earth. Well, don't get so worked up, folks. The extraordinary feat that created the panic over the skies in Eloy, Arizona, is the work of a team of 46 skydivers setting a world record. The skydivers jumped out of two airplanes and flew in an elaborate heads-down formation with remote-activated fireworks strapped to their feet. They free fell from 16,000 feet with speeds reaching 200 miles an hour. Skydivers came from 11 different countries to participate, and they practiced multiple times during the day before breaking the world record for a new vertical night jump. And finally tonight, we see a very precious sight. An overprotective mum decided to let her kids go out for their first ever stroll outside. Well, it may sound a bit depressing, but trust me, it's far cuter than it sounds. Take a look. Now to Russia, where two polar bear cubs have taken their first steps outside in the snow at an eastern Siberian zoo. According to a staff member at the Orthodoidu Zoo, the cubs were born in December 2023, but the mother of the cubs did not allow them to venture outside until they became strong enough. The cubs are born blind and weak, weighing only around 500 grams. The mother bear 
named Kolimana, was found orphaned in 2012 at a natural reserve in Yakutia's far northeastern Arctic Ocean coast. The father, named Lomonosov, was born at the Leningrad Zoo in St. Petersburg and later moved to Siberia. The zoo's name, Orthodoidu, means middle word, world, in Yakutia's Sakha language. According to local myth, the middle world is where animals and humans thrive, while the upper world is inhabited by the gods. Well, to me, that sight was unbearably cute. No pun intended. Well, that's all the stories we have to report for you tonight on World News, wrapping up this week. I'll see you again on Monday with more updates from across the globe. Till then, have a restful weekend. Good night.